Hello and welcome to the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. It's superb as always to be here with you. Um, and it's always a pleasure to be joined by my mentor in style and substance, Paul Bindig. How are you, sir? Well, thank you, David. I don't know that I do too much style or substance mentoring. I don't know if uh, cricket shirts are a new style or what have you, but it's great well, to they be should here. Be. <laughs> they, absolutely, they absolutely should be. Um, so, no, great to have you here as always. And um, uh, we, we're really pleased to introduce our guest um, this episode, Mr. Dave Cohen. Now, it's not about numbers, Paul, and it's, it's, you know, Dave brings so much more to this discussion that, but I think it's worth just by kicking off that Dave alone has played on more than 60 number one hits and produced another eight number ones himself. So if that's not a reason to talk to a great keyboard player, I don't know what is, let alone the fact that he was recommended by Steve Nathan, who, you know, we, we admire terribly on this show. Um, it, it was just a no-brainer to have a chat to Dave, and I, I think you'll enjoy this chat. We cover a lot of ground, and um, yeah, it was good overall, wasn't it, Paul? Oh, it was excellent. And you know, I was reflecting, uh, David, that I've only played on sixty less number one hits than what Dave Cohen has. So you know, we were. <laughs> In common, which is which is why I love talking to him. I, I'd actually argue based on the quality of my output, I played on sixty-one less. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. no great guys. So you know, anyway, here's here's our episode with Dave, and we'll see you after the show. Dave, lovely to have you here on a Saturday night, your time. Hugely appreciate it. As we discussed before recording, um, our audience may not know Dave is a huge clubber, so he's actually delaying his clubbing time to be with us this evening so yeah really if this it. doesn't end in uh uh about 45 minutes uh you're gonna start to s maybe you'll see m <laughs> the wall start to melt because that's all the drugs will start kicking in that's right <laughs> this is a natural timer on this so i'm gonna start if i become a raving lunatic you know why this have, have you even noticed that, that after a while the day will get the herbert long twitch going because it'll just who need to get out to the club. That's what will yes. happen. So we'll, we'll exactly. know we've gone through Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Dave, thank, thank you so much again for joining us. And, and look, let's kick off by, by finding out about your formative years in music. So uh, tell us what got you started as, as a young person getting involved in, in music, uh, playing the piano, playing keyboards. Yeah. I, I mean, I started really young. Uh, I started, you know, like five, four or five years old. Uh, I started in piano lessons and maybe my, one of my grandparents, uh, uh, friends taught me twinkle, twinkle, little star. And I was you, equipped to <laughs> play that back after a short while. So that was all my parents needed to throw me in piano lessons. Uh, so I did, uh, uh, uh you know, sort of traditional piano lessons for a child till the age of maybe 13 when I was given the option to quit piano and I seized that option and uh, didn't <laughs> play for a couple of years and then started playing music with some friends in high school and it, that, you know, it came, I came back around to it on my own time and um, started to... Uh, realized that the piano uh, uh in a rock band scenario was uh it was tough to keep up with these guitars <laughs> and uh so i uh, uh got a keyboard and learned that the rock organ setting was kind of cool to play with and rock organ one rock organ two uh were my go-to's on this casio something PSR 640. Actually, I, I roll my eyes. I'm in good company here. It was a PSR 640. Um, and um, that was, uh, we started playing, uh, our name was the PT Junction Blues Authority. Uh, and the, the band before I joined was Poison Teardrop. So uh, it was PT Junction. Then we played blues music. We obviously watched a lot of Blues Brothers. So we we played, there was a blues bar in Calgary where I grew up that had a uh, Hammond organ in it. And 
Uh, I thought that was the coolest thing. I learned how to turn it on. I was too scared to pull the draw bars. But at that moment, I didn't realize how fleeting of a moment it was. The top manual sounded like Rock Organ 1, and the bottom manual sounded like Rock Organ 2. So I was like, this is great. <laughs> uh, not knowing what draw bars were or any of these things. And at that moment, at that time, that was my experience Uh uh, the next time I got there, it didn't sound like that. And I was going, oh my God, what now? Uh, figured out, <laughs> pull the draw bars and like, oh, this is cool. So I became able to jam with these guys and, and, uh, it was random blues music. We also listened to fish. We were hippies and, you know, uh, uh, as, as it were, um, and, uh, so that it was by the end of high school, it was, uh, pretty obvious for me, my grades weren't fantastic. And, uh, there was this thing called music school where I could play the piano and get accepted into a post-secondary, uh, education situation, which, uh, you know, was like, wow, that's a great, I <laughs> okay, I'll do that. Um, so I moved to Toronto across the country, uh, uh, across Canada, um, and went to Humber College for jazz performance and uh, did basically like the two thirds of their jazz performance degree. Um, and those years were... Um, interesting i w was you know young and uh uh music school was great for me it was forced practice uh, uh more than anything um i you know it's like that's when i learned to play in all keys and i learned jazzy voicings in all the different keys and to be able to I, I learned they're just enough to be dangerously jazzy sounding if I need to be, which was, uh, you know, would come up later in life, a, a tool in my tool belt uh, to, you know, at the time I was rebellious and said, music school is so, uh, it's so confining. It's like, uh, it's, uh, it's like, it's so mechanical and learning mathematics for, for, you know, I, I was like, this is, this isn't music, man. Like, I want to just jam. Um, and jam I did at night and all of these things. Um, got on MySpace, as you did in that day. Um, and I started listening to uh, modern-ish country music. Um, not necessarily because um, I was like, you know, I wasn't raised on country music and, and that was, you know, like, what kind of music do you like? Um, uh, everything but country was a popular answer of the day. <laughs> um, so I, but I, I did hear that Hammond B3 loud and proud on, on these records. And there was, it was, you know, bands playing and as, uh, musician that played live music i listened to these records and i could kind of relate to them um more than i could a lot of rock stuff that was just guitar driven there wasn't a lot of you know keys in it obviously i was a big like deep purple fan and i listened to yes and i listened to you know and i could play the intro to foreplay long time and uh you know like there were these there was uh, uh, these anchoring moments in in rock music, but for whatever reason, uh, country music uh, seemed to uh, be this accessible way to play keyboards with modern music. Um, and so I reached out on MySpace to a bunch of Canadian country artists, um, not knowing how the industry works really at all and uh it turns out that most of these like six or seven acts that i had uh um that i had messaged were managed by the same company and so the same 
social media person, which was like cutting edge at the time, like to have a social media, you know, new media uh, a person uh, running their socials. Uh, um, so this person became a longtime friend of mine. Uh, <laughs> and so she, Tracy Wilder, who, uh, who still manages the, one of the artists, put me in touch with one of those artists that was, you know, could have used a keyboard player. And so basically I was given an opportunity to, uh, uh, go on the road, long story short. Um, and I, at the time I was teaching piano, um, I was playing bar gigs, weddings, bar mitzvahs, um, uh, you know, um, jazz, you know, jazzy lounge piano gigs, cocktail hours, all, all of that, dance bands and, and, and that stuff, um, you know, cutting, cutting your teeth on live gig stuff. Um, and, uh, but I got this opportunity to go on the road and he was an up and coming country star in Canada. His name's Johnny Reed. Um, <clears throat> and he still, he, I mean, he, he went on to sort of transcend country music and he's this like, uh, you know, Rod Stewart folk, uh, uh, sort of a crooner guy who nailed the, um, figuratively, uh, the, uh, you know, 40 plus female demographic, <laughs> um, and to this day uh, has an incredible career in Canada. He he lives this under the radar life here in Nashville, and gets on an airplane, lands in Canada, and he's on a Tim Hortons, which is a coffee shop in in Canada. He's on the Tim Hortons commercials, and he's like, I mean, he he's a star there, and goes up plays a one tour a year and cleans up because uh, at this point he owns he's a smart business guy so he owns all of his records and he owns he doesn't work with you know he he's able to negotiate with a, a, a concert promoters and stuff that he basically puts on his own tours and has that woman Tracy Wilder who became my roommate and we're friends she's still in Toronto um, she, she still manages him and like, they just, uh, I don't want to, uh, um, like, I don't want to minimize anything by saying they have that shit on lockdown, <laughs> but they have, they have a good thing going in Canada. And so, uh, they've built something very cool. So, um, that was my, that was in my. I just want to get on a tour bus, get me out of music school. Uh, I'll do anything. I'll play any music and I'll go anywhere. Just let's go. Um, and what were, what were your learning experiences from that first tour with Johnny, Dave? I, I mean, those first, I ended up playing with him for six years. Um, and so I learned how to be a road musician. I learned how to live on a bus. I learned how to just exist in that kind of uh, scenario. And I mean, I learned that I loved it. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, I learned, um, learned a lot about, um, you know, it's like I got my heart broken by, the first time I got my heart broken by an artist, like go, you know, and Johnny, I, if you're watching, like, I love you, you're, uh, you're awesome and everything like that. But like the uh, learning, the artist is not your friend. They are running a business and you are an employee and it's all for one and one for all until it's not. And, um, so I, you know, I learned a lot of important lessons sort of even on my exit from that gig. Um, uh, cause during my time with him, I picked up and moved to Nashville, um, 
realizing that um, there was a ceiling um, in Canada and, and Australia is v- very similar in the uh, uh, country music infrastructure. And I've been to Australia a bunch of times with, with artists playing C to C festivals and, uh, 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 you know, co- co- country rocks, the hunter. And so Canada is very similar, like Australia, where <clears throat> like if, unless you're playing with a, international artist who tours outside of Canada or Australia, um, there's kind of a ceiling to even, you know, what full-time employment looks like with one artist. Um, And while I was playing with Johnny, he was a huge artist. Uh, I played with some other big Canadian artists, but I was still teaching and I was still having to play gigs and I was still, you know, it's like the bigger you get as a, a Canadian artist, it's kind of like the, the less gigs you can play. Uh, there's only 13, maybe if you're like, if you're generous, 14 major markets in Canada. Um, and, and so you end up, uh, as you get bigger and start stop playing the little towns and the tiny towns and you're only playing the bigger markets and arenas and theaters and that um you know across canada tour is f- you at, at one point it was 50 dates uh and then it was 40 and like how i don't know how many uh, how much touring can one artist do and you know you have these clauses where you can't play within the last eight months within, you know, 500 kilometers of these. So, um, I knew that I wanted and maybe needed to, uh, uh, move to the States, uh, to, you know, whatever was next. I was 21, 22 and going and realizing there was a ceiling there and you know the guys that were you know i was at me when i was at music school <clears throat> the the faculty which was the sort of flagship thing of the school and their incredible musicians canada's truly canada's finest jazz musicians are are in ontario teaching at mohawk college teaching at humber college teaching at these places uh, cause it's a good gig for a brilliant jazz musician. And they're also playing the Rex in Toronto at night and they're, you know, they're putting out records with their names on it and just being badasses, virtuosos. Um, but, uh, in my heart of hearts, like I wasn't a badass virtuoso. <laughs> uh, I was a, uh, journeyman keyboard player. And when I would say, you know, I'd be at music school and play a live clip of like a great touring band. Like, I mean, Britney Spears touring band. If you listen to Jay Z's touring band, like just the, 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 just jaw dropping, awesome musicianship. And, playing that for my peers at jazz school. And they're like, I would never do that. I would <clears throat> like, I, I like I, you know, and, and it's like, if it wasn't a fifties blue note record, uh, it was outside of what the, what the goal was, you know? Uh, uh, and you know, Bill Evans is my favorite jazz piano player. Uh, Um, but I was no Bill Evans, nor was I, nor did I sort of see myself sort of going that way. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be a, I want to be a hired gun. That was, that was the, the goal. Um, so when I, given the opportunity to leave music school early, um, I, uh, took that opportunity and, uh, 
never looked back. So you, you moved to Nashville, which, as you said, was a logical extension because there was, I guess, more work than, than, than lining up with uh, the, the big stars in Canada. Mm-hmm. So your, your initial move to Nashville was, was, was doing touring. Can, can you tell us what you remember from that time and, and who you were working mm-hmm. with and, and what that experience was like? Yeah, it was it was like... It was like all of the touring that I had done just with the volume turned up Um, because all of a sudden you live in Nashville and I'd looked at LA and I looked at New York also to move. At the time I lived in Toronto, Nashville was the closest. It's a 12 hour drive. Um, New York, there's there's not much of a there's it's struggling as far as its local musician scene is for for all that it is um the, you know it's a struggle not to mention exorbitantly expensive uh LA is a similar thing there's a certain cachet with LA that i never really felt at home with um and it was also like the other side of the country and and at the time I was working in country music and it just sort of seemed logical. And so, yeah, I moved down there and I was really fortunate to have that Johnny Reed gig, um, for the first couple of years that I lived in Nashville. Um, he lived there and in Canada, there's a lot of fly dates. Um, a lot of the crew is in the East coast of Canada. A lot of the lighting like lighting and sound guys were in Vancouver. A lot of the, like, uh, uh, the horn section was from Halifax. And for Johnny Reed, we all flew to a place, played a show, or we all flew to Toronto and got on a bus or wherever the tour started. Um, and so Johnny was sort of generous enough to go, well, I mean, I would have flown you from Toronto, so I'll just fly you from Nashville and, and I would fly with him you know, and, and do that. So I moved there with this little bit of a safety net, having that gig, um, especially on the, um, immigration front being, uh, a, 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 a foreigner moving to the States. You can't just like show up at the border and be like, I'm here to be a musician. <laughs> They're like, where's your work visa? And I'm like, what's a work visa? <laughs> oh boy. Uh, that has been a lifelong sort of, I don't say struggle, but it's just this extra thing that us foreigners have to deal with if we want to work in, in the States. Um, and so because of those limitations, I couldn't uh, just like get a job waiting tables at a restaurant. I had to work in sort of narrow, I could, you can bend rules to work freelance kind of technically technically your income needs to come through the entity that sponsored you but if you had their permission you you know so anyways it was like i was living in this gray area working with johnny reed when uh playing on lower broadway in nashville um playing just trying to do what i did in toronto which is play local clubs play all get the local thing happening meet the people who are touring meet the just get a lay of the land and and make friends um and so i spent my first couple of years here doing that um and maybe it took me a little longer to get situated because i would just sort of get up and go for weeks at a time. And, <clears throat> but, um, I got an audition for a guy named Joe Nichols, um, who is, uh, you know, he's a country music star here. Um, and he's not an A, you know, he's a B C level artist in that he's had number one success and he goes away for a year or two years and then comes back and, and sort of, it's never been super consistent with him, but he's had enough hits that, that there's this space in America and especially in country music where there is this circuit of clubs and bars 
uh, these country clubs that you can tour endlessly uh, 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 around America. There are, you drive two hours from one place to another and you're in a whole other market. Like the density of the population here compared to Canada where you're just, and Australia is very similar, you're just driving endless hours in between towns and then there's a town and then it's like, okay, on to the next town. It's like 10 hours of oblivion and it's not like that here. It's like Nashville is, I mean, you are in, I mean, you are arguably, and I say 10 hours, uh, 10 hours on a tour bus overnight drive is a no brainer, easy thing to do. So you are the easiest bus ride away from a huge amount of touring possibilities. And so where I was in a place where I was in Canada touring with two of the biggest Canadian artists and I was doing maybe 50 dates a year, um, which was, you know, that's all I was happy. It was awesome. Uh, and I moved down here in the first year with Joe Nichols, we did 130 dates, which was like a medium year for those guys. Um, so just the, the concept that I could play for an artist, just one artist and be that guy's keyboard player. And that's my job was like, holy shit, I've made it. This is awesome. Yeah. So started touring with Joe Nichols and that was just awesome. And I just lived that for, I was with Joe for five, four years. Um, and then, you know, uh, me going, all I want to do is be on a bus, get me on the bus, uh, turned at some point to get me off of this bus. Uh, I will do anything to get off of this bus. Uh, I'll play weddings and bar mitzvahs and whatever, if I can just sort of sleep in my bed. And, and, you know, I was in my late twenties and I had played every country music venue and flew to Australia for a one-off and then flew back and then flew back to Australia for two weeks of tour, like in one six month period and played all of the like TV shows over the years and did all the like Letterman's and late night TV show stuff. And we played halftime shows at, at, at um, you know, American football games, um, uh, at NFL stuff. And at some point, um, the, the key in all of this that I sort of haven't mentioned is that I feel it was something that did me really well, uh, was this recognizing the people in whatever thing I was doing, recognizing the people that were like thriving and doing well at it and recognizing the people I'm going, I can learn something from you that I don't want to be like you. Um, and whether that had been, uh, when I was on lower Broadway here playing four hour long bar gigs with no break. And, you know, I would, at the time you can't do it now cause it's so crowded. Like at the time I could take my Volvo station wagon and I would drag my Leslie 145 and my Yamaha S90 ES and Nord and my Yorkville keyboard amp. And I was always the like, I play real organs and stuff. I couldn't have a real organ, but I would drag that Leslie everywhere. And I was the guy, like the idiot with the Leslie. And, and, and so that's where my head was at. It's like, we're playing this sh shitty gig. Um, I'm, I'm able to be my best self. I'm always my best self. If there's a loud Leslie behind me screaming, uh, and I keep one close by <laughs> at all times, you can kind of, this is going to ruin the vibe, but so I've, oop, there's a couple organs over there and you know, this is my studio here and a piano over there. But anyways, 
long story short is that I, um, <clears throat> I was, I, I did everything I could to sort of be my best self on these things because I could see, you know, you can see it, you get on stage and Hey, I'm so-and-so and you're the bass player. And he's going like, yeah, fuck. I mean, God, a fucking gig and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, kind of like, okay, well, if you don't want to be here, get the fuck out. Uh, and it was the same on tour, tour buses w when I was bright eyed, bushy tailed on and just excited to be on a tour bus. There was the guy that had been on the tour bus for 15 years and was just like, ah, oh, just another pregnant and a late driving by and, and we didn't get this. And the road manager didn't get us this and, um, you know, like whatever it was. And, and, and I'm going like, okay, I'll never be that guy. And sure as shit, <laughs> fast forward X number of years, you know, road manager goes, Hey, you guys are playing Letterman next week. And my response was, Oh fuck. Like <laughs> my, like, I'm, they said, you're playing Letterman. And I'm going, we have to fly into LaGuardia at 5 a.m. We're going to have a lobby call. It's going to be shitty. We're going to sit around the studio. Letterman famously kept his uh, 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 set at 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was, it was cold. It was just kind of this like miserable experience that after you do it two or three times, the magic is worn off and then you just go like, you just all you think about is the early morning and the lobby call in New York not in a like you don't have time to do anything fun in New York you just are groggy um so when I kind of caught myself being that that guy um I would be you know it's like I I was emailing the band leader about unpaid travel days like I was I had all this time in the world I was golfing five days a week we were you know and at some point i'm started to get this feeling that i'm i don't want to say wasting my life but like there's more i could be doing with my time with myself so much to the point that like i started researching like getting a psychology degree online i was like I don't know. I think psychology is really cool. And one day I'd maybe like to be a therapist or something like that. And, and so like, I don't know. I looked into that. I never actually did it, but I still get predatory phone calls from all of these, uh, uh four higher, you these like for profit universities here in America. It's like, they still had like 15 years later, they still have my information and, uh, st still call me and ask me if I'd like to start a degree and you and know. that's your fault for reaching out on MySpace, Dave. It, oh, it, it, this is all begins on MySpace. This whole thing, <laughs> start, yeah. So good riddance. Uh, I mean, I'm grateful. <laughs> Thanks for the memories. <laughs> that's right. And so, Dave, it was there one pivotal moment where you finally you you reach the point of going, right, I am done with touring now and it's, it's yeah, something more st uh, stable for me? Yeah, I mean, it was around that time where there were these, I had a couple of these sort of check-in with myself moments of, like, there was the overall, this, I'm, I'm, I'm bored or I'm wasting my time because there's just so much downtime touring and you can be as productive as you want to be in your own time, especially now with, you know, like you can have a recording studio in any hotel room that fits into a little overhead bit in your, in your overhead bin. And if that, you know, like maybe had that been the case, things would have been different. Who knows? But, um, it, there was this point where it was like, I need to make an exit strategy. Um, and for me being Canadian, having that road gig with work visas and whatnot was um, important because I needed a sponsor um, to keep me in the country and whatever, unless I jumped up to the next level of immigration, which was a green card, permanent resident. 
And so it was like, okay, uh, if I do this, how do I do this? Well, it's just very expensive. Um, and I wanted to buy a house, for example. Um, but at that time, after the 08 crash down here, it was harder to get a mortgage, you know, whereas maybe in, in, in 07 or 08, a touring musician could just be like, yeah, I'd like this house. At, at that point, uh, it was not that straightforward. Um, so having the road gig with the, uh, here in America, the W-2 income, but having that income on paper that you pay taxes on and it's, you know, you're not playing, you, I'm not going like, I made, I made a, uh, you know, ca- I made all this cash from gigs and whatever. It's like, it's all there on paper the way they like to see it to give you a mortgage. So I got, I bought a house, this house that I'm uh, in right now, that is now my studio. Um, and I moved, have since moved, but um, I got a green card and I got the house. And so I was like, okay, I am ready to make my grand exit from the road. Quickly sort of shifted my phrasing uh, from from I'm not going to be on the road to I'm not going to commit to a forever never ending road gig um, because I got off the road and then I didn't have any money <laughs> and needed to go on the road to get some more money. <laughs> um, all the while building up, you know, trying to meet people here and and work with songwriters and and just do my due diligence to try and break into the in-town scene but in a different way than I did originally uh trying to not play lower broadway and trying to not play the the low hanging fruit gigs that don't really lead to bigger things I look at your income stream as like literally that it's a river of I mean, sometimes it's a it's a small <laughs> trickle, uh, but it is a river of money with with momentum in a certain way. And to divert that river or stream or rill or whatever <laughs> uh, a dry riverbed <laughs> uh, it may be at the time, um, it takes some time to kind of move the thing and it moves slowly and at some point the stream of income comes uh, goes a certain way a different way and um so yeah i started building the session thing uh, uh which turned into you know i didn't know what it was gonna look like i mean um i at that time started i didn't know if i was gonna be doing more like writing for film tv instrumental stuff i remember i was gung-ho and i spent eight hundred dollars on this um now it's it's the like miroslav philharmonic it was this 20 gigabyte platinum package string library that was like the ui was just impossible and you had to pro- like in order to use it properly like you had to program every every articulation change and it's not you know like now we take for granted like session strings pro goes from pizzicato to whatever and it then sustain and then you hit it hard and it changes you know to whatever it's like this was not that and I was doing bad work, uh, with, uh, but advertising myself with this great string orchestra. And I'm going to, you know, you need strings. I'm your string guy. And try to be all these things to all these people. And, you know, put a bunch of, to use a fishing metaphor, you know, to try and put as many hooks in the water and seeing if I get any bites, so to speak. And, and, and you and you obviously did, Dave, and and because of time limitations, I would love to talk about how sure. that worked out. But I'm thinking we'll we'll jump forward to the fact that you know you're now 
what, 10, 15 years into a highly successful career. And it's impossible to cover off, obviously, what yep. you've done. But I thought maybe a way we could approach that is five artists that you feel you've had the biggest impact with or that you've learned the most from or had the most memorable sessions. So, I mean, if that's not too hard a task, no, just maybe, not. yeah, maybe start with an, an artist that really had an impact perhaps in those earlier days. Yeah. So, I mean, very quickly, my first uh, demo, my, uh, my first thing that turned from a demo session. So in Nashville, long story short, I know I, I ramble, but long story short, there's demos. So uh, th- we have an active uh, 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 union here. Um, and so when you're doing a union um, recording session in Nashville, they have uh, negotiated that if the plan is for the recorded songs. If you're not going to sell them, you're not going to put them on the radio. You're going to use them in the business to pitch songs. So songwriter comes in, wants to make a demo of their song. Publishing company can then pitch that song, and then they can re-record it and whatever, do it. So I was playing on on, on demo sessions, and the first time that I played something on a demo – Somebody said, who played that on that demo uh, was a, a producer named Brett James, uh, who's a big producer, and he was producing a guy named Kit Moore, uh, who's had a bunch of success. And so that was my first master session uh, that turned into playing records. And um, eventually, uh, more of those things started happening. Um, I then... Over the years, I I got in at a good time because I happened to be, I was known as the sort of synth guy. This is in 2013, 2012, and, you know, country music was going through an identity change, and all of the traditionalists were, you know, for 50 years in Nashville, being a keyboard player. Uh, in Nashville sessions meant you played piano, you played B3, you played Whirly, you played the Rhodes. And if you're crazy, you do a clavinet solo, you kind of put a clav through an amp and like wacky. Um, And then at some point I started offering up synth pads and stuff and tempo synced arpeggiated stuff and just subtle pulses and transitional effects and these things that um, I think because by accident of birth, uh, I am the age I am and Max Martin and mid nineties pop music is my reference for uh, a lot of synth stuff. Whereas a lot of the existing keyboard players in Nashville that were the guys at the time, their synth touchstones were 20 years earlier. So it at the time th- what and what that just translates to is the difference between a cheesy synth sound and the right synth sound is you know th- the turn of a a a cutoff you know n- filter cutoff is like this much you're cheesy this much it's cool and so i think my natural instincts worked with what was going on where things were going on radio and that allowed me to be the synth guy. Um, I was the the young guy that if you want the bleep bloops on your synth and, and, and it's just these country producers going like, yeah, man, just do something modern. Like, I don't know, man, just do, do like, make, make, make one of those wacky sounds with your keyboard. <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay. And it's like Pavlovian, like the weirder, the sound you just like, turn a filter and jump five octaves and jump back down. And they've like, just never heard that sonically. And I'm like, yeah, like, okay. I started working. So Kit Moore was big. Um, uh, I started working with Florida Georgia line. Um, That producer, Joey Moy uh, produced uh, a whole lot of people, Morgan Wallen, Hardy, um, he produced all the Nickelback records back in the early 2000s, another Canadian fellow. So he was a big ally to me um, in that session scene, and he brought me on a lot of records um, in that in that world. Um, and then I played on 
uh, uh, Old Dominion and, you know, I played on, it just sort of just turned into being the keyboard guy. Um, but, you know, the there was definitely like, oh yeah, you're the, there's a couple of, you know, there's a couple of piano things that sort of I became known for in certain ways um, on, on, you know, on some Morgan Wallen records that I started getting called for like, hey, do that thing, <laughs> you know, or do a version of that thing. That took me into sessioning and then, yeah, and then I started writing and producing and all the stuff afterwards. So um, uh, with with the um, uh, you know the, these changes and you know you've talked about how you were really starting to in, infuse different kinds of sounds into your recordings and yeah. and as David mentioned earlier you've you've had this uh, very extensive uh, production career working with some some top line artists I'm I'm curious as to how this has influenced your playing how, how do you feel your playing and the way you approach playing whether it's on a session or even in a live situation has evolved over that time, what the, how's the play you are now different from uh, the young man who who started touring uh, in Canada? Um, I mean, I think uh, I mean restraint, perhaps is is a lot of it. Um, you know, le less truly in a lot of ways is more, um, and uh, the it's just all of the parts. Like I, I am the same person that I was, but I just have a couple of extra tools in this tool belt that I have been, uh, the metaphor that I've been building my whole life. Uh, and so w when it comes time to play on a Christmas record, you know, every year right around June or July, <laughs> it's Christmas in Nashville. Uh, and um, when it's time to play, kind of be the jazzy guy I have this thing I can go and I can I have those tools and when uh, the the producer stuff informs the playing stuff because I have been in the situation where it's after the the um, like like I know what a song is going to need I can think like a producer which takes you out of it's a little it's like it's almost like you t remove a certain type of ego and zoom out which i wasn't able to do until i was charged with you know uh, 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 uh seeing a production through um and i'll i mean at some point all i knew about m music and recording was keyboard stuff um but then i learned about kick drum patterns and guitar you know, the pickup selections and, and, you know, just all of the, the, the million and one little decisions that go into producing music. Um, you start to have opinions on this and then this, and then it gets more and more narrow until, you know, until you're the old guy that, you know, has strong opinions about all of the little things. Um, but definitely um, those things helped me be a better player because uh, it it took me out of the, let me show them a cool thing that could go in this verse when truly the thing to do is to lay out and not play. And when I play in the back half of that verse, I enter, the entrance is so much better. Uh, you know, our chorus hits harder if the verse is emptier and you start thinking that way and you start looking at the, the arc of a song and not just the, what synth sound can I play, but more like what's going to make this verse the coolest, what's going to make this pre-chorus feel like a pre-chorus and what's going to make that chorus hit the hardest. Um, and so thinking about it from that, you can start to be an ally to the producer as a session player by going, just by going, Hey, I would lay out here, but check this out. I'm going to do this at the top of the chorus and it's going to help, you know, whereas perhaps 
earlier in my career, I would have just been like, check this out, check this sound out, check this sound out. And it's almost like the more amateur producers were the ones taking the bait and saying yes to everything because it was a cool sound, you know? And so you play a cool sound and they go, oh, that's cool. Put that in the intro. Play, could you play that four bars before the track? You know, so it starts out like, and you know, like there's a time and a place for all of that. Um, but learning that time and a place, uh, is, is, you know, what you gain over the years, I think. That's a great, no, I think that's a great point. And, and probably related to that, Dave, is just what keeps you excited about playing. And I, I want to, you posted a great video on Facebook in the last week, which was you lay, laying down a banjo part on the keyboard. <laughs> and, um, and, and obviously yeah. you, you weren't presenting that as, as, um, as a normal part of um, a more detailed approach to playing. But I'm just interested, what keeps you excited versus the, the tedium that can occur with production? Uh, to me, it's the balance of doing all of the things. Um, when I only play sessions, I've proved to myself and this town that I can be as busy as you can be. Union says there's three sessions a day, five days a week. You can actually work six days a week. Shit, you can work seven days a week. And you can do a 10, 2, and 6. And I can live my whole life with headphones on. And I've been really fortunate. And I've won the awards, the the statistical awards that you played on the, the most number of top 10 records. And the voted on awards. Like, uh, 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 But the, the it, you know, it's like... But if it's too much of any one thing, um, that's that's where the thing. So it's like I'll spend a week now. Like I'm living my best life these days because I spend a week in the studio working with an artist, and then um, the week after I've got a, a week of writing. And one of those songs that I wrote, artist likes the demo I made and wants to wants me to produce it and turn it into a record. So there's symbiotically, I get to wear all these different hats. And to me, that's, that's where the like long term joy is. Cause I, um, I had this feeling of, of, you know, uh, uh, of like peaking too early in the session thing. Like, going, I'm 31, I'm getting positively reinforced for this, but do I have to do this for 50 more years and then die and that's it? Because I can see that's going to be a problem for me because I I don't know, I'm just like, I'm a what's next kind of guy. So this allows me to, what's next? Well, next week is something completely different than this. So that's cool. I think I think that's a great point. So you've just mentioned, Dave, about you know what's next. So you you and you said yourself, you probably have another thirty or forty years of your career remaining. Um, what do you see changing in the industry over the next ten to twenty years? Do, do you see that there is a future for studio musicians and producers at the level they are now? I do. I am optimistic that um, all of the things that make it difficult. For for people to make a living in music get sorted out as, you know, everybody says, and, and any time that I've been in a new place, everybody always says, man, you should have been here 10 years ago. Uh, like, you think this is great. Man, in the 90s, we were touring. I went from one tour to another. And like, man, in the in the 80s, we were doing sessions all the sessions and they and they paid double scale and man they paid triple scale and all these th these bygone things that like don't exist anymore but um i've it's like you i've seen the industry adapt enough times that i'm able to keep a rosy outlook and go like whatever it is you know be open to it and you'll figure it out. And if that at some point as a keyboard player, that meant bringing a laptop on stage, like that meant playing 
like I don't know. I was a piano and B three purist, and I didn't play synthesizers like until I did, and then until I was offered a gig that needed me to do that, and then I'm like, okay, this isn't so bad. Uh, so the pivoting thing is, I think, um, uh, uh, I think that the industry is able to pivot, and I think that we as musicians and keyboard players uh, are able to pivot, and we're in a unique position um, to maybe be able to do more in that, um, like as I sit here and play fake banjo things on a, you know, uh, uh, my suite of fake guitar instruments is is long and dense. Uh, and it sounds amazing, though. Everything on that you were hearing was fake. Drums, fake bass, fake guitar, fake everything, because I can throw together a, a relatively good sounding demo uh, uh, in, in short time. But, you know, the guitar players don't have that same thing that they're able you know it's like the innate ability of a great guitar player you can't it doesn't translate as well so i think that our ability as keyboard players to almost be more than just keyboard players uh, uh i think that also uh, is something that'll serve all of us well i i expected death threats after that video but anyway uh, there was if you look in the comments there's some 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 uh uh, uh you know there's some very prominent uh, Nashville session banjo players uh, that were tagged and uh, uh, definitely spoke their mind. <laughs> All great guys, and yes, like I mean, I'm I'm not put. I don't. I truly don't believe that I'm putting any banjo player out of work. In fact, I do believe that by me putting this fake banjo in this demo, I'm guaranteeing them a gig if the song gets cut in a real studio th that, that one of those gentlemen will get the call to actually play it <laughs> hopefully, or they'll just use the demo and no harm, no foul. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's interesting listening to you talking Dave about how you've, you, you've sort of said versatility has been the key and will continue to be the key. And I think that's probably a great, lesson for a lot of uh, musicians players producers mm -hmm. and you, you've, you've talked about the uh, how you've evolved as a player as well and the the fact you've been willing to take on different things and serve the song more rather than think about what cool thing you can do and, and i'm curious uh are there any other key lessons that you'd you'd love to pass on to other keys players that are just things you've learned and observed over your over your career so far yeah i mean just in general, I tell everybody to chill. <laughs> like, and what I mean by that is, especially in Nashville, and I can only assume this really is anywhere, but um, give yourself a gift of, of an extended, extend your timeline of expectations. If you think that you should be, after two years of living in Nashville, I should be doing this and I should be doing something. I should be doing more or that guy's doing something. If you give yourself this gift of maybe it's not two years, maybe it's five years, maybe it's whatever, that headspace shift will transport you to being a different human being and a different musician and you will be able to live your life lighter and fancy and freer um, and be a cooler hang and be a better ally to the people around you um, uh, if you just chill and be a cool guy as opposed to being the making music from a place of fear or um, – like it shows up in players when they are, you know, if you're fearful of losing the gig, maybe you'll overplay a little bit. If you, if you're fearful of, 
of uh, uh, you know if uh, low self esteem as a keyboard player shows up in notes, just as low self esteem as in human beings shows up with a flappy mouth that you know sometimes isn't so welcomed in in certain places. So by giving yourself that gift, uh, 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 you remove a certain amount of desperation. Um, and that shows up in songwriting. It shows up when a songwriter, for example, who's, you know, uh, and this can be a keyboard player who's been successful maybe 10 years ago and is trying to still figure it out. And if they walk into a room going with an energy that's, that's going like, Hey man, we, I, I, I don't know what we're doing today, but we just got to, it's just got to be modern. It's got to be a hit. Like we just got to do like, do something, you know, if you're trying to uh, uh, trying to be modern or trying to be like something else and you're not making music from a place that's just real to you, um, you you can't really put the best foot forward. And so long story short, uh, when you're getting established, like give yourself a gift of of not adding that extra weight on your shoulder that serves no purpose um and will come out as uh, hurting your ability to just be a cool hang Uh, great response and and so dave we've got a couple of our staple questions that that people love hearing from, from our guests and one is just tagging a keyboard player so you were obviously tagged by the brilliant Steve Nathan as someone that um, you know would be wonderful to speak with, and, and we're certainly glad we, Steve, Steve mentioned you. So, is there someone you tag that you'd love to hear more about? Um, yeah, I mean, I I, I kind of look like a, a younger version of myself, <laughs> uh, uh, ever so slightly younger. But there's there's a you know a guy named Alex Wright that is. A, 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 a keyboard player in Nashville, um, and I assume that his story is quite different from mine. But we've ended up in a lot of it, it, he he is crushing the game, as they say here in Nashville. He's the like the new guy that's playing on all sorts of awesome records, and I bet you his perspective, even just being a couple of years. Uh, 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 behind me, he probably moved to Nashville like after I had already sort of been and started doing. And the same way that, you know, 10 years ago when I started, Steve Nathan was, was you know, probably uh, 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 like busier in certain ways uh, than than he is, you know, or any of those guys. The As far as the career arc, like he's on the rocket ship upwards so I'd love to, you know, I'd love to pick, I always want to pick his brain on like, what's it like for you, dude? Um, and then no, no, there's, dude. you know, uh, and if we could get Bill Evans on here too, that would be. Uh, <laughs> we'll do our best. If you want, if you want to work on that, that would be appreciated. There's, there's a project for you, David. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> I mean, AI, like if we've got enough of a body of, I bet you we could have a conversation. <laughs> let's do that how would bill evans uh, solo over these changes these modern changes in this a modern feel i bet you ai could tell us that i bet you're right hey let's let's not stop at bill evans let's go to bark if we're going to do ai interviews david this could be uh this could be the new thing i I like the idea this is very cool Uh, dave another question we love to ask all our guests is what are the five records albums you could not live without your desert island discs what would they be um bill evans live at the village vanguard um it's a double disc and then there's also it's like live at the village vanguard and then there's another one that was also like recorded at the same time that had a different name and so those two records were incredible uh Wallflowers bringing down the horse to me the B3 playing on that record is a textbook of what to do <laughs> in the it's, a, it's just 
it is to me that's perfection um and rami Jaffe, that would be a great guy to get on here uh and uh and uh obviously um i mean any tom petty records but uh you know um oh god benmont benmont yeah. tench uh who i think the two of those guys played b3 on that wallflowers record um those guys um the sneaky subtle awesome synthesizer on the no doubt tragic kingdom record to me is a this sneaky like it's in rock music and it's the synth stuff sounds like synth but it's not like 80s prominent synth only it's like guitar plus kind of uh the that that blending of stuff um uh, uh deep purple machine head obviously we got to you know john lord's got to be there on this island with me <laughs> you know excellent um, and then dave we do our quick fire 10 so 10 questions with super short um, sharp answers if if you're able so um uh, kicking off with um first keyboard you ever owned uh casio sk1 the most important pre-session ritual for you oh god i can't say smoking weed can i <laughs> you can you, you definitely can't say smoking weed everyone dave did not say smoking weed did not no say i didn't it. say so if 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 it wasn't smoking a little weed <laughs> Um, it is, uh, uh, just checking in with your, with your surroundings and seeing who, you know, who's in the room and then appropriately moving forward with that, how many songs you're trying to get in that day, lay of the land, and then you take a deep breath. But both appropriate sponsors, uh, responses, and I won't be editing that out. Um, Kitas, sexy or an abomination? Uh, I will take a MIDI and accordion over a guitar, respectfully. Great, Ed. Cool. Do you use the transpose button, or do you always uh, manually, mentally adjust the key? Um, I can confidently play in all keys, and I can say that with a very straight face. There is a time and a place uh, for for transposing in the studio. There's a lot of stuff. So this is a short answer. Uh, no, no, uh, no. Cause I've watched, I've watched, uh, uh, guys lose gigs, uh, f from, you know, transposing and then being on the Opry stage at a grand piano and realizing way too late that they have to play the song in a flat and they've been playing it in G for years. So I've watched more yeah. people hang wow. themselves. Wow. Cool answer. Thank you. Um, favorite session you've ever done, Dave? I went to Key West, Florida to make an old Dominion record last year uh, at um, Jimmy Buffett's little recording studio uh, in the middle of Key West. And that was an incredible vibe. <laughs> What's the favorite gig you've ever attended as an audience member? Uh, I mean, um, Hell Freezes Over tour, the Eagles. That was the first time I saw a B3 player on stage in was 95. I'm going like, whoa, awesome. Now, that's great. And looking back to your, your live days, um, Dave, the best thing about playing live uh after show food <laughs> what's the always worst pizza thing on the butts oh yeah absolutely what, what's your favorite pizza uh i am uh i like new york pizza if we're in i like the a flat flat round large slice <laughs> nice nice what, what's the worst thing about playing live um I mean, the travel, a lot of it. Um, and then also recently, um, I'm being used to... Uh, 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 short answer, damn it. 
I feel like sometimes when I'm playing live that uh, uh, the nuance is getting lost on people talking in the crowd, which I never thought about before. And now I'm used to every nuance being recorded. And when I play live, I go, that guy missed what I just did. This is for nothing. Like, nobody's listening. (laughs) Why am I doing that? I like that. Yeah, huge agreement with that one. Um, Dave, Dave, name one thing you'd like to see invented that would make your life as a keyboard player easier. AI to get Bill Evans to answer my questions (laughs) about how he does what he does. This is a theme for me. And lastly, what's your favorite non-musical activity or hobby? Cars. I love cars. Uh, I like working on cars and driving back roads on the weekends. With what's, other your, what's, yes. what's your favorite car that you maybe own? I have a. I I bought a Porsche 911 uh, uh, from 1990, which was, uh, you know, the car, when I was five years old that car came out and I was like, Oh my God. So my entire life, if you ask my parents, like the, the, what's, what's the reason you play music? It's like, so I can buy a Porsche 911. That was, cool. that was it. So yeah. Uh, good, good as reason, good a reason as any. And Dave, I realized we, we missed a pivotal question, which is uh, a, a time when something went terribly wrong for you, either live or in the studio, a musical train wreck. Do you have one that well, comes to mind? Yeah. I mean, I definitely got up to play a gig and forgot my sustain pedal and uh, play an a, like, arena full of people. And I had to play the piano intro to a song and you sound like a t- two-year-old trying to play. Like it's very difficult to play a legato piano intro with no sustain pedal, and that is what I did poorly. Wow! Did it, did anyone say anything afterwards? Like, did anyone comment? Um, what, that sounded strange, Dave. What, what went wrong there? Did, did you get any uh, feedback? Like, th- I was adamantly blowing my own horn about how this was. I was also, that was early in my touring career, and I was also, um, took on road management duties uh, at the time, and so I was charged with counting in merch and making sure the bus driver got a ride to the hotel and whatever, and so in the melee, I forgot to set up my sustain pedal, and it was uh, a a mistake that, uh, the mistake was being a tour manager. (laughs) I can imagine the snarky messages on MySpace after the fact. Tell me about it. <laughs> Dave, we can't thank you enough for taking the time. Like all of our guests, we'd love to spend about 14 hours talking to you because you, you, obviously we've only scratched the surface, but really appreciate you taking the time. And um, hopefully we'll um, see you out in Australia again in a more leisurely way where you get to spend some real time. I'd love to. Thank you so much for having me. Holy crap. Okay, and there we have it. So, Paul, wonderful chat with Dave. What a guy. Yeah, amazing. And it was really interesting. He, he, he's quite philosophical. So there, there was a lot of interesting thoughts and ideas. And I really liked the fact he was able to share his mental and, I don't know, professional approach to music. I thought that was great. Yeah, no, enjoyed that a lot. So huge thank you to you again, Dave, for taking part. It was it was a buzz. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we'll, we'll be back again in a couple of weeks, we're, we're coming in thick and fast with the um, episodes, which is wonderful. Oh, it's, um, it's nice to be so busy. There's so many great keyboard players to talk to. I was just thinking, David, um, you know, we have a great friend. His name's uh, Joe Mascara, and he, lo- he loves listening to this podcast. And thank you for your support, Joe. And there might be a lot of listeners like Joe. Joe's a bit of a uh, completionist, so he likes to listen to every part of the podcast. And that's because his... his uh, um, I, his uh, podcast listening app tells him it's finished, so then he can mentally move on to the next podcast. So I was, I was thinking maybe you and I could talk for the next, 
I don't know, 90 minutes or so. Um, <laughs> you know, what are you doing today? Did you want to do some work in the garden? We could talk about the weather. Um, you know, just, just so that, uh, you know, Joe's got lots of interesting things to listen to. So that, the, 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 you know, just, uh, I know he likes to listen to everything. So yeah. let's give him some extra content. What do you think? I think, I think you're onto that. What I'll actually do is customise so only Joe receives that content and everyone else gets the normal show. That's a great idea. That's a really good idea. We should do like a three and a half hour version just for Joe every time. And the, and the last, I don't know, two and a half hours could be white noise, maybe. I don't know. It's, it's, it's worth thinking about. And, you know, thinking of you, Joe, and, and the reason uh, we make that uh, joke is because Joe's posted on the musicplayer.com forums about the podcast because the podcast has its own forum there and they are one of our gold supporters that we appreciate a great deal. So do check out the musicplayer.com forums if you want to um, take part in the banter around the podcast in that type of forum. Um, our other gold and silver supporters, Tammy Catcher of Tammy's Musical Stew. Can't thank you enough, Tammy. Um, Tammy's just kicked off... Uh, a replay of, again, a lot of the really iconic Tammy's Musical Stew episodes that she's curated. So definitely get on to that. Um, and also, as thank you as always to Brother Paul Brown from The Water Boys. Love your work, Brother Paul. And then last but not least, Radio Grande, a YouTube channel devoted to bringing you funk and soul reimaginings of some great songs. They're going from strength to strength. Killer one with um, Justin Bieber and Kid Leroy was the last uh, one they've done. Love it. It's, yeah, on my playlist quite regularly. So that's that's all our supporters. Thank you. Um, we'll be back again, as I said, in a, in a week or two. Um, but just a reminder, we love to hear from you via the website, www.keyboardchronicles.com, on, on Facebook at Keyboard Chronicles, Twitter at the Keyboard CHR1, and then good old-fashioned email, editor at keyboardchronicles.com. If you'd like to become an official supporter, we do have a Patreon account, Joe, where for the price of a coffee a month, you can help us go from strength to strength. And that's not me hitting at you, Joe, to pay up. It's just, so, you know, I know you're the only one left listening. Um, so that's <laughs> patreon.com forward slash keyboard chronicles. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Um, Paul, thank you again for joining uh, me again, and we'll see you in a week or so. Yeah, thanks so much for once again having me on board this amazing rocket ship to keyboard playing knowledge. That's right. And um, thank you all out there for listening. We do appreciate it. And we'll see you back here next episode. Yeah.